Hey everyone, this is Steve from the BTI Web Services team. Today we'll be finishing our part two of the RESTful EXT data store. If you missed part one, go back on YouTube and check it out. So we'll be looking at proper server responses for EXT store CRUD operations. We'll also look at EXT record definitions and settings. I'll show you how to bind EXT data records to forms and take the data from forms and put it back into the EXT data record. And finally, I'll show you how to uh, bind the store uh, request to Spring and bind it to a Beam. So the proper server response what we need to do is we need to send success true back for every uh, service call to the back end. EXT doesn't recognize the, uh, the response codes of 200 is okay, 400 isn't okay. Um, instead it needs to look at the success true property. So we need to send that back in every, re in every response. Another thing that the EXT data store requires is data to be put in a root attribute. So all the root attributes, all the data in there will be corresponding to a record inside the store. So the read operation, um, this is like always, uh, if you've ever used a store, you use the data tag, that's the default um, data, and you pass a collection of, of records that you want. So in our case, we've got two definitions of set and list. Those will produce two records in the store. And finally, you need that success true in there for it to recognize that it was loaded. So next up is the create and update operations. So what we do here is we send the persisted object back in the response under the data attribute. So if we look at this down here, we send back success true. We send back the record that was persisted. So in our case, we posted a new dictionary word of compiler and the definition. And what we did here, we only sent name and compiler, or the name of compiler and the definition from the front end. But what the back end did, it actually assigned an ID of two to that um, to that uh, definition. So what happens when the response code comes back is, or when the response comes back, the store recognizes if any fields were changed and it updates the store record appropriately. Finally, the deleted operation, nothing is really needed here except for the success true. Um, since we aren't persisting anything, we're just coming back and saying, yes, that delete operation was successful. So EXT record definitions and settings. So in the EXT record field, um, we need to set the name attribute. The name attribute maps to the JSON that we're sending back. And also, um, the name attribute is what we're sending to the server uh, for each field. Allow blank. If set to true, the store won't save the record unless a value is present in the field. So if you want to verify that you aren't sending bad data to the back end and you need a value to be there um, before you persist it, you can set allow blank to true. And so if auto save is set to true, it won't save it. If you call save on the store, it won't save it. Um, so it'll just sit there until the, the record is actually, is actually valid. Another cool thing is type. So let's say that you have a Boolean or a date. Uh, it takes a string and can actually convert the string into a Boolean type. Another useful thing is date. So we might send back the date as, uh, as a certain um, date format. And we can actually specify the date format um, option in the field um, config option. And that will actually convert the date that it sees from the response and will convert it into a JavaScript date object for us. There's plenty of other uh, JavaScript uh, types. Check it out at the Sancha um, documentation. So form binding to an EXT data record. So form binding is really cool in the respect that if you set up a form that mimics an EXT data record with all the fields defined, 
um, you can actually load the record into the form and you can also take that form and update the record that that was loaded so in our case if we have a name and definition field set um, and the record mimics the exact same names if you call um, get form dot load record it'll take all the fields from the record and place it into the form for us then if the saver uh, if a user wants to uh, modify those records in the form they can call they can update those records or those fields and actually if you call update record on that form and pass in the record all the form values will be read and placed back into the record so if we have the store auto saved that to true, once you call that update record, it'll fire off an AJAX request to go update that record at that point in time. Or, uh, like we showed in part one, you could call store.save instead. So spring binding. This is an implementation. Obviously, this is one implementation. You, if Based on the back-end services that you're running, you could be doing this any way that you want. But we'll look at spring binding for our case. So Spring easily binds JSON from the JSON writer to the corresponding Java bean using the Jackson deserialization. When we bind to a bean, Jackson will call the setter for each given JSON property name. And let's say that what you send to the backend isn't exactly corresponding to your bean. You can also use the JSON property annotation to actually change what property name you want. Um, that's being sent from the front end. Please keep in mind that you need to implement a default constructor in order for Jackson to bind since it creates the bean uh, and goes through and calls all the setters it can't recognize um, your, your custom um, constructor. So finally in order to bind the request body use springs at request body annotation this tells Spring to take the request body that's being sent from the front end and bind it to, in our case, the Java bean of Word. This works by default and that should get you running with Spring button. So let's take a little look at our code here. So we've got our Spring controller with our request mapping of uh, slash dictionary. Down here we've got our post method. So here's our request mapping with post. We've got our request body, which tells Spring to bind to the request body and bind to actually this Java bean of Word. So let's go into the Word definition. And as you can see, we have a ID, a name, definition, and I just added a user. So we can show a little bit more complicated binding. So let's go into user. And in user, you can see email, first name, and last name. Once again, we've got all of our getters and setters for each property, same as in Word. So Jackson can serialize and deserialize. So let's actually hit our service. And I will show you what we want to do. So in here, in the Firebug console, We've got a user object, which was mapped to that bean. So we've got our email of foo at bti360.com, first name of foo first, last name of foo last. We've got our record, which is compiler with a definition of the compiler, and we're passing in the user. Then we've, we're going to get our store. We're going to create a store record from that uh, JavaScript object and then we're going to insert that store record into the store at index 0. Let's go ahead and run this. And you can see we've got a post. So in the post, we sent our definition, name, and user. And then when you go in user, you can actually see the email, first name, and last name. Let's take a look at the response. So in the response, we have success true with the data of name, the ID that was assigned from the back end, definition and the user of email uh, first name and last name so let's actually change this a little bit and we're going to change the user object a little bit to have a little bit more complicated um, so actually let's create a uh, name class so we'll have a class of name and we'll assign a uh, private string name first private 
string last. And then let's click generate our setters and getters. And select all. Hit OK. Let's save that. And then let's go over to our user object. And let's get rid of the first name and last name and change it over to name and name. Okay. Then we need to change this getters and setters. Uh, so we'll change that to name, get, get name, get name, return back name, change that to name, name, and then finally name. All right. Now let's go ahead and remove these two fields. Let's save that. And now when we go back into our uh, into Firebug, let's actually change this so our user object is now name. Make that a JavaScript uh, object and have first have first. And last, and let's run that. Okay, let's take a look at the post. We've got our user, we've got our name, we've got our first and last name, and then let's look at the response of user, name, first, last, and then email. So as you can see, the binding works um, great. Uh, you just need to remember to set our default constructors. In our case, we don't have any, but for a lot of beans, there are the user of you know first last um, string first string last, and you set that to public. Um, if this is your only constructor, this is actually going to complain uh, for Jackson um, because it'll say, hey, we can't create a uh, user object for you. So keep that in mind. One last so one more thing that I wanted to show you guys was the fact that we're changing the default implementation of the JSON writer a little bit. So by default, what JSON writer actually wants to do is it wants to send the data back in the request under the root tag. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't work out very well with Spring binding because Spring is actually going to look at each property in that request and is going to try to bind appropriately. Um, so let's actually take a look at this R implementation uh, that we have here. So if we hit run, it posts a new thing. Uh, let's look at the request and you can see it's just the definition, name, and user. Let's go turn it back to the default. Let's save that. And then we're going to go ahead and go back here, hit refresh. Um, we're going to send this request again. Does another post, but let's look at the post instead. So right now we see data uh, with the other fields inside the data tags. And based on what Spring was expecting, it says the name is null, ID is still specified, definition is null, and user is null. Well, that's because when Spring tried to bind, it saw this data data property and said, hey, there's no setters for this property. Hence, it nothing got set. So keep that in mind. You might want to use this uh, if you want to use Spring binding. Uh, it's pretty simple. You just come out this one line of code, replace it with this line of code and you just apply the data tags to the JSON data directly instead of actually putting in the root. So hopefully this these two part series helps you guys with ext data stores and hopefully this uh, spring binding tutorial will actually get you guys going and using the ext data store. Alright, hopefully this went well for you guys. Till next time, bye.